Today's topic is uh, why there are so many religions in the world. Have you ever wondered why so many religions? Mm. You know, today we, you're going to get a, an understanding of why we have uh, so many uh, religions in the world. The dictionary defines religion as the belief and, and the worship of a superhuman or a superpower or powers, especially a god or gods. But for us Christians, uh, it means the worship of the only living, the only true God of the Bible, meaning the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So it is the worship of this one God that we regard as the Christian religion. And when the Lord Jesus was here, he told us that God actually doesn't like all the uh, ceremonies and things that people were doing because he preferred to be worshipped in spirit and in truth, meaning his word. Because the Lord also told us that the word of God that he spoke to us, they are spirit and they are life. So, and the Bible says that God's word is true. So we look, take a look at uh, John chapter 4, verses uh, 23 and 24. He says, this is the Lord Jesus uh, talking to the woman at the well in Samaria. He says, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. In other words, God is not interested in all the offerings and blood things that they were doing. He's looking for people that will worship him in spirit and in truth, using the word. Like he said to me, he said, let me hear my word coming out of your mouth because his word is truth. Put me in remembrance of my own words, you know. So he says, to, uh, the Lord continued, he said, for the, the Father seeketh to, to worship him. He said, for God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is why you pray in tongues and then you pray the word of God. As worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Unfortunately, there, there's a group of uh, uh, people that don't believe in worshiping God in tongues anymore. So, because the Bible says when you pray in tongues, it's your spirit that is praying. You don't have a, a, a conscious understanding of what you're saying, but God understands, you know. So, now, why, what happened? Why do we have to worship God this way? Because one of the things that I was not aware of uh, before I share my rapture dream is that uh, we were, I know the word, we were all in Adam because we all came out of Adam's loins. In other words, every single human being today is a product that came through Adam. And so in Adam, we actually were, were, were children of God. We were being in fellowship with him. We basked in his fatherly love. We fellowshiped with him and we worshiped him. And we actually took a walk in the cool of the day with him. When Adam was doing these things, we were doing it in him. And I didn't know this until uh, before, my, uh, before I got born again, actually, I was seeking. And I had spoken to someone who told me about the cross of Jesus. And that day I felt like the, the, what they said to me reconnected me with my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom I had met when I was dead. And he told me how to get back and get back into my body. And he basically raised me from the dead. So on this time, I wanted to know, to say thank you to God. And so when I took the first step to say thank you to God, that night, God the Father gave me a dream. So he showed up. In this dream, I heard, I call it my rapture dream because uh, it was basically rapture. It was a whole, uh, it, was, it, was, it was like there was an announcement on earth that says, here comes God. And immediately, we were all caught up to meet uh, the Lord in the air. It said that it was God the Father. And as soon as he appeared, I looked at him and I looked at him and I go like, I know him. He, 
I mean, I know this man, I know, I know, and I know that I have seen him. And so all the while he was going around laying hands on people and people were worshiping him, he kept his eye on me and I'm trying to remember where I had met him because I, he wasn't a stranger to me. He was somebody that I knew and I was trying to remember where I, I had met him. So he went around and then he came back to me and he, he looked at me and he winked. He said, of course you know me. We were together in the beginning before, before sin separated us. Meaning we were together in the beginning in Adam with him and we enjoyed his fatherly love until Adam and Eve sinned and we got separated from him. So and I was like, oh, so this is why I tell people there is not a single human being. When you see God the Father there, you're going to say he's a stranger to you. Because if you make it to heaven, you will know him because you have seen him before. You know, and there are some people that have his expression to the T. Some people have his smile. Some people have his facial features. I mean, it's like you can just place every single person's face and see him or aspects of him in every one of us. You know, so we were together in Adam and we learned I mean, in, with him in Adam and we learned to worship him. We learned to bask in his presence and in his uh, love. And so when Adam and Eve were driven away from the garden, one of the things that they lost was the presence of God. And so man has been yearning for this presence that he lost, you know, and also has been living in fear because without that presence that covers you, the devil, you're, you're kind of like a, a free, you're a free target to the devil and his demons. So you see that most people live in fear, more so than other people, but everybody has some kind of fear or another. Because it is the fear of death. The Bible tells us that the devil used to hold man in bondage until the Lord Jesus came and broke it. So we learned, in other words, to worship God and to fellowship with him in Adam. And so when they were driven away, Adam began to make sacrifices unto God because he saw God offer a lamb and he too began to offer sacrifices, blood sacrifices to God because he spoke of the future atonement work that Christ would do for us on the cross. This is why when you read the story of Cain and Abel, Abel brought a blood sacrifice and Cain willfully brought a grain, which is not the kind of sacrifice that God needs for future atonement. So now, this was man trying to reconnect with God, learning how to worship the only true God, the Almighty God, the Most High God, as it was known in those days, and by offering sacrifices to Him. They had no idea of any other form of worship until Nimrod came on the scene. And we're going to find out about him in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 and, uh, to 10. He says, and Cush, Cush is the son of Ham. Ham was the son of uh, Noah. So you uh, uh, Nimrod was the great grandson of Noah, in other words. He says, and Cush began Nimrod. And he became, he began to be, be a mighty man. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it was said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom, listen to this, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Karneh, and Shina. So what you surmise from this is that Nimrod was the first man to organize the world under him. He established the first kingdom. He ruled all the people that were on earth at his time. But unfortunately, Nimrod was a tyrant. And when the Lord showed him to me, he was a black man. Nimrod was black. His rule is recorded in uh, Genesis 11, chapter 1 to 4. It says, and the whole earth was of one language. Listen to this. I especially need for black people to listen to this because sometimes we think that God has been unfair to us. No. 
because the first person to rule the world was a black man. Then listen to what he did. He said, and the whole world was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shina. And they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick and made stone and uh, slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build, this, build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, and let us, uh, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. You see, in the beginning, God said, after he restored the earth, he said to man, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. But these people, under Nimrod, they found a place and said, we're not going to go all over the earth. We're going to stay right here, and we're going to build a city, and we're going to put our name on it, and we're going to build a tower. And you're going to find out why they're doing this in a, uh, in a minute. Does that uh, ring a bell to you today? They are a group, there's a group of people that want to turn the world into one world government and they want to depopulate the earth. They want to put a certain number of people that they want to be on earth. So, I say this to tell you, as Solomon said, there is nothing new under the earth. Because what man is doing today is what man did under Nimrod. Because Nimrod was the leader and he taught the people to rebel against God Almighty. Because he hated God. He hated the Most High God with a passion. And he told his subjects that he was their provider and not uh, the Most High God. He instituted idolatry and declared himself to be their God. And the people began to worship him. He taught the people to be self-reliant. He told them that they should not rely on God. It was only cowards that rely on God, but then they should uh, rely on their own strength and they should rely on him because he was the one that was providing for the people and not God. And then he said out that he said he's going to build a tower that will reach unto heaven so that should God have it in mind again to destroy the earth as he did during the days of his uh, forefathers, him and his people will escape. You know, so now listen to a summary by Flavus Josephus about uh, Nimrod in the Antiquities of the Jews, uh, book 1, verses 3 and 4. This is what is written about Nimrod. He said, now it was Nimrod who excited them, meaning the people, to such an affront and contempt of God. You listen to this? To such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold and a great man with the strength of Ham. He said, and he persuaded them that he, uh, he persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as he will, that through his uh, means they were happy. In other words, they should not ascribe their happiness to God, but to believe that it was their own courage that procured them that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny. He was a tyrant when the Lord showed him to me. Seeing no other way of turning men away from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence upon his own power. He also said that he would be revenged on God if you should have it in mind to drown the, earth, uh, the whole world again. For he would build a tower too high for the, the waters to be able to reach. And he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. So you see, Nimrod, had, he hated God with a passion. Or the devil steered him up to hate God with a passion. And he says in uh, ver, uh, verse 3 of uh, the Antiquities, book 1. Now the multitude were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod. In other words, he persuaded the people and they followed him and they did whatever he said to, to them to do. He said, to esteem it a piece of cowardice to, subject, to submit yourself to God. So in other words, in the days of uh, Nimrod, if you so much as say that you're submitting yourself to Almighty God, they called you a coward. 
you know, and it says, and they, uh, and they built a tower, neither sparing any pain, nor being in any degree negligent about the work. And by reason of the multitude of hands employed, uh, employed in it, it grew higher sooner than anyone expected. But the thickness of the wall was so great, and it was so thoroughly built, that thereby its height seemed uh, upon view to be uh, lower. In other words, when you look at the wall from the ground, you will think it's not as tall until you try to see it and climb up or onto it, then you see that the tower was really tall. So Nimrod wanted to build a tower to escape God's uh, flood. And I said that he didn't pay attention because God had promised that he would not drown the earth again with water. But Nimrod had taught the people idolatry. He made himself to be the God and the people followed him and worshipped him. So in God, if you, uh, when we read, that, uh, read Genesis 11 verses 5 to 9, we see God's response to what Nimrod and the people under him were doing. It says, And the Lord came down to see the city, and the tower with the children of men built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, in other words, united. And they have all one language. And this that they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they imagine to do. Go to, let us go down there and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad, thanks for what, upon the, earth, the whole earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it is, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did confound their language, and all, uh, did confound their language, and all the earth, and he despised them, in other words, to all the earth, he scattered them abroad upon the face of the earth. So now the people have been dispersed by God upon the face of the earth, their language confounded, so they now all have different languages. What do you think happened? Remember the topic. Why we have different religions, why there are so many religions, in other words, in the world today. They took the idol worship that Nimrod taught them with them, even though God scattered them all over the earth, they took this idol worship of Nimrod with them everywhere they went. And the devil helped them to hold on to their rebellion against God. This is why when you look at the earliest ancient idols, all over the world, you will see that they were black. Because Nimrod was a black man. So over, over time, the memory of Nimrod began to fade because the people were now scattered. And so now that they are dispersed and Nimrod's memory is, is, is faded away or is wind down over the years, the people now desire to reconnect. Because remember, we were all with God in the beginning in Adam. So man knew fellowship. Man knew how to approach God. I mean, man knew how he felt to be in God's presence. So the soul of man yearns for that. You know, because man is very spiritual. You know, so now with, uh, with the memory of uh, Nimrod fading, the devil then started to inspire them to give him proxy worship. In other words, worship the devil using items that represent him. So he began to inspire them to worship uh, trees, to worship the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, and the things on earth, and to worship stones, to worship all kinds of graven images made of ceramics, made of uh, terracotta, made of porcelain, made of jade, made of brass, made of gold, all kinds of figurines, and to worship ancestors and to worship other humans and to even worship the serpents and the dragon you know so and i remember one time the lord said to me once uh, he was visiting he said he said you know man is an intelligent uh, being you know man is not stupid you know sometimes when god the father is talking you just listen he said man is not stupid then he said 
What do you think will make man? What do you think will make a man to bow down to a tree? Or to bow down and begin to worship a piece of ceramic? He said something has got to have happened to that piece of ceramic. And we see it today. Because I never knew what God was talking about until I started seeing how the spirit of vanity works. When I went and bought, uh, before then, uh, if, uh, if you're going by the aisle in the grocery store and you see all those uh, half-naked uh, magazines with women, some of them, when, if you're spiritual and you can discern, will wink at you. They will just wink and hold the wink at you. The first time I saw it, and I was like, what in the world? And I went to pray with somebody in her, in her picture. Her picture winked at me. And because I was wondering why in the world are magazines, uh, images of women on the magazine, or even men, winking. Until uh, this lady's picture in her house winked at me. And I said to her, your picture looks clean, but it just winked at me while we were trying to pray and she said oh that's my vanity picture when i was trying to be a model that was the vanity picture i was sending out so it connected to the magazine so the lord began to show me the spirit of vanity the way it works it, it goes on an item and it displays or it performs and gets people's attention who are seeking something to worship so if you're walking by a tree for instance and a tree speaks to you, or a tree winks at you, you begin to think that the tree is something special. If you don't believe me, millions of people go to see bleeding statues. They go to, to see weeping statues. What do you think is in those statues? Demons go in there, and they weep blood, and they cry. You see statues uh, shedding tears, weeping, and you think they are something special. And these statues are being crowned by certain denominations, worshipping demons, worshipping the devil. You know, something has got to go in there. This is why during the reign of the Antichrist, the false prophet is going to make the image of the Antichrist to speak. A demon is going to go in there and begin to speak to the people. Because that's what they want to see. So, God said it. Man is not stupid. Something has got to happen to a, a tree or to a ceramic, piece of ceramic or some graven image to make a man bow down to it. You know? So it's like you read in the Bible, you hear that the devil spoke to, I mean, the, the devil spoke to, the, to Eve in the serpent. Until I saw the devil, he was shown to me in a dream. The, the, the serpent talking. And I'm like, what in the walking? He has legs like a crocodile, the, the, the alligators. He, had, he, he was moving like an alligator before then, until God cursed it and the leg disappeared. You know? So, just the same way, when God showed me, uh, he, when He was dealing with me about the sins of the previous generation, because God is a God that redeems us from everything that has happened to us from images, graven images, idols that we have worshipped. And I remember when he said to me, uh, you know, where he found me is deep darkness. I didn't know what he meant until he started doing the work in me. And all of a sudden, one day, I saw this thing come out of me. The Holy Spirit just brought it out. And it was a piece, piece of quilt. And on top of the, the last piece on the quilt was that of my uh, dad's mother, because I know that fabric very well. And before then, you can see the pieces that each generation had added to it. And it was long and as it was going away, and it went all the way to, believe it or not, to Nimrod. That was how I saw Nimrod in front of his uh, uh, hut, dancing and proud, very arrogant man. And I'm like, huh? You have been the cause of my problems? You. You know, God, when he, told, when he told me, when I asked him, why did you destroy the world? He said, but I saw you. 
See, God can look through the generations that are doing evil and see the future generations that will do righteousness and because of that hold his peace and not bring judgment. So I have to repent for all the generational sins that goes all the way back because he told me, he said, your ancestors had a head in introducing idolatry to the human race. That's the darkness. So from where idolatry came from, God is determined to uh, bring forth uh, offspring to himself that are righteous. That's how dark it was, you know. And so what does he do? He looks into each and every one of us, our background. He redeems us from all the idols and the things that we had worshipped and the generations before us had worshipped, you know, so that we can become what the Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All the generational curses, all, but you have to, they don't just pass away, you have to kind of like speak and renounce them, then they pass away. All things have become new, all things are of God. So you have to speak what God has done for you, as the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Because the devil is not a gentle man that says, oh, you got born again, so i got to pack up and go. No. The, the Lord says he considers your loss, a, a, the loss of a personal possession. He goes into all kinds of uh, uh, antics trying to get you back. So it's you that has to speak. You speak the redemptive work that God has done in your life so that the devil can go and you can now replace what he had uh, uh, previously established in your life with the Lordship of Jesus Christ, with the will of God, with the Word of God, and Jesus as the Lord of your life in those areas, you know. Otherwise, the devil will continue to harass you with generational curses, you know. So when I saw uh, where God brought me from, I mean, generations that I had no dealings with, but the, the evil that they did was impacting me, and I was wondering, why you want to make move forward one step, this things want to take you back ten, you know. So now, the Bible says that uh, when you come to Christ, when He redeems you, you are no longer going to be of the your previous household. That is uh, all the generational curses and the lineage that are full of the curses and afflictions. He said you become a member of the household of God. Jesus actually becomes your lineage and your inheritance. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. It says, For through him, meaning Jesus, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. This can only happen when you come to Christ and you make him your Lord and you, you ask him to forgive you of all the generational uh, curses that have been plaguing you and members of your family. When you do that, God hears you and he begins to shut the doors that they had there or windows that they had opened against you so that you can have uh, a blessed life. Otherwise, the devil will come again and try to make you to be like the generations before you. Now, if after hearing this, and you go like, I've had enough struggles in my life from what the generations before me did, and I want to belong to the Lord Jesus, I want to be a new creation in Christ, I want to appropriate what he did for me on the cross, it's very simple. He made it easy. Just open your mouth because you believe in your heart and tell him, the Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart. I sincerely believe that you are the Son of God, that you came into this world, you died for my sins. Today, I come to you and I ask that you forgive me of my sins. For you died on the cross and you were buried on the third day. God the Father raised you up to give me eternal life. So today, I repent of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Give me eternal life. Cleanse me with your blood and baptize me with your Holy Spirit. When you do this, God will save you. You know, He will, he will give, make you a new creation so that you can have a fighting chance in life. Amen.